it's, it's Hello, everyone. Still. No, yeah, it's uh, it's we're live now, and okay. um, I'll just give a little intro. So I'm Robin, and uh, many of you may know me from my emails or posts in the Facebook group. And uh, Sarah is, as you know, unfortunately, uh, held up by a flight, so she can't be here tonight. Uh, but she sends warm greetings to all of you, and uh, it's a pleasure to be in the Asia Pacific region, uh, <laughs> virtually of course, because I'm based in London. And uh, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed everything so far. It's week three of online UWC, and this week we're looking in the Asia Pacific region uh, at topic eight: curb human-induced climate change and ensure clean energy for all. And our guest lecturer this evening is Chris Leahy, who's an educator who's passionate about environmental and experiential education and education for sustainability. And he currently teaches uh, environmental systems and societies at Li Po Chun, United World College of, the, of Hong Kong. And he also chairs their sustainability committee and facilitates the campus sustainability group. And before this, uh, he taught science in Cambodia, Thailand, and New Zealand. And so... Before I hand over to Chris, uh, just a little housekeeping. So, as ever, just ask your questions in the Q and A feature in the right hand side. It, it's, if you if you haven't got this activated, uh, it should be available. You, you should have some icons in your left the left hand side of your window, and you can uh, you can activate it uh, on the right, and you can just type in questions. Um, and then Chris will give his presentation, and we'll we'll deal with them at the end of the at the end of the the, the presentation. Uh, yeah, so without further ado, um, I'd like to hand over to Chris. Excellent. Thanks very much, Robin. <clears throat> Hopefully everyone can hear me and see me. Um, I can't see you, and we'll, we'll make our way back to the questions and all of that in just a minute. So... Um, I'm just, I was looking at your brainstorming on Padlet, what human-induced climate change and sustainable energy mean, and there's some great, um, some great ideas on there. Um, I was thinking when Sarah Josephine asked me to do this, uh, I was thinking, holy moly, it's a really huge topic, and it could mean a whole range of, of different things. Uh, to different people and and um, to different issues and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So what I'm going to focus on is one part of that issue, which I think kind of encompasses a range of ideas about sustainability and um, and fits in with that goal of of curbing our human induced climate change and and. Um, trying to move to sustainable energy. So the first, uh, let's try and get, where are we here? Okay, so always start with a quote. Pollution is nothing but the resources we are not harvesting. We allow them to disperse because we've been ignorant of their value. For those of you who don't know, Buckminster Fuller was a rather famous chemist. If you take chemistry, you know about his... Um, Buckminster Fullerene, his C60 or Buckyball, but he did, he was actually quite prominent in the environmental movement too. And, and I think this is kind of a poignant um, quote because currently we are, pollution is a rather wide term and there's a lot that we aren't harvesting. We're not, we're not, um, we're not using all that we can. And wouldn't it be amazing if we could harvest what we currently term pollution, whether it's air pollution when we think about climate change or whether it's water pollution or soil pollution or whatever. So something to, to kind of think about as we go through this. Uh, and I think it ties in well with the solutions at the end. So hopefully what you get out of this um, is what we buy what we eat and where we throw our waste has huge impacts on sustainable development as well as our contribution to climate change. So the idea that sustainability is is up to us. We have the power to change the planet. I'm reminded of that other quote by Margaret Mead that 
Um, change is always something to the fact that change has always happened by through a small group of uh, committed, passionate people. Um, so that's us. We have the power to do something. We just have to figure out how to do it. Um, and I think hopefully in the pre-class activities, if you didn't already know or didn't already think so, you saw that climate change is definitively a human issue. We are causing climate change. So I'm bringing, uh, I'm using the topic of food waste, essentially, food packaging is, and waste to highlight the issue of human-induced climate change. So I've got there the, the um, what you might call it, the Venn diagram that we often see when we talk about sustainability. And sustainability encompasses the economy and society and the environment. And I think food waste, as with many issues, is it relates well to this because it, it has parts that link to all three of those. So for example, agricultural production has a significant effect on the natural environment, as you might already know. And it's also responsible for a large portion of pollution of our greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. Um, food waste is not being evenly distributed, or food is not being evenly distributed, and waste is piling up, and that becomes a social issue. And food waste and packaging is also creating disposal problems which affect the environment, they also affect the economy. And, you know, no one wants to live beside a, um, a landfill, so they also affect society. So I think food waste actually is a good example of how we can look at a problem and consider all three aspects of sustainability. And so I thought I would start and I would talk briefly about how they link to all three aspects, okay? So food production and the economy, it's estimated that about one-third of all the food we produced is lost. One-third. So imagine you make a meal for your family. Um, you make a pot of pasta and sauce, um, or I suppose we're in Asia Pacific, you make rice and, I don't know, curry. And you take half or a third of that and just chuck it right in the garbage because it's lo it, that's what happens. It's lost. So you can imagine the monetary loss that that one-third represents, um, and not to mention the social loss, and et cetera, et cetera. So there's a huge monetary loss in how we currently approach the food we eat. Um, food waste also contributes, um, sorry, uh, food waste represents a significant loss of revenue for producers, transporters, and retailers. You can imagine if you were a producer um, and you're harvesting tomatoes and something happens and a crate of tomatoes falls and they all get bruised, those get chucked out. Um, for the transporters, maybe there's a there's an accident or the refrigeration unit goes down and all of your food goes off. Um, retailers, obviously, we've all been to markets, especially in Asia, where, you know, the especially the wet markets where they've kind of got the, the, the produce that has gone off, off to the side that they can't make money off, as much money off of um, anymore. Um, I found a stat that said in the U.S., in 2008, it was estimated that approximately $165.6 billion was lost because of food waste. Billion with a B, that's a huge amount. So our food production, our food waste has a significant effect on economies or that economy part of the Venn diagram. Um, food waste results in greater amounts of refuse that need to be disposed of. Um, so you can imagine if food goes off, we then need to either send it to a landfill or some other way of disposing of it. And that's going to have other costs to, again, retailers, to producers, 
um, to transporters, to municipal governments, to whatever, whoever disposes of the waste. It's different depending on where you come from. So in the UK, 600,000 tons of food waste is disposed of per year. That's a massive amount that we just throw away, essentially. Um, and food prices are incredibly volatile. So either the retail or the consumers are getting hit with food prices that jump all over the place, or the producers and retailers are getting hit by making less money, which unfortunately we all know rarely happens. But anyway, um, an example, uh, well, I should say that food prices affect, um, affect the poor uh, disproportionately to the rich. Um, in 2007, 2008, there was a huge spike in food prices. So if you're making less than $2 a day um, and food prices go up by over 80%, then a huge chunk of your salary, or if you can call it a salary, is, is going to, um, to food and obviously you can afford less food. So I'm not going to st stick on the environment. I could probably talk about food production in the environment for a long time, but um, food production, new research uh, shows that about 50-ish percent of greenhouse gas emissions, human-induced greenhouse gas emissions, are related to food production, okay? So you can see <clears throat> on the left-hand side, you've got non-food related emissions between 43 and 56 percent, and on the right-hand side, you've got all of the food related. So about uh, 12 percent are related to the production, uh, 15 to 18 percent related to making the farmland to allow for the production, and then about 15 to 20 is involved in getting that food from from the farm to the consumer and then about 2 to 4 percent is waste. Um, so that that represents a massive amount of our greenhouse gas emissions. Well, it represents half. Um, so if we can produce food better and we can waste less, then obviously we can produce less and hopefully curb our human-induced climate change. Um, sorry about all the writing on this one, but a lot of the deforestation that's occurring is to meet our agricultural needs. You've probably heard about the palm oil plantations in Malaysia and Indonesia and, and Thailand as well. Um, so that palm oil is being used to uh, to produce all sorts of processed foods, peanut butter, um, I can't think of anything else right now, but all sorts of processed foods have palm oil in them. Um, in South America, the issue there is soy, so um, soy farmers are causing a lot of the deforestation in, um, in the Amazon. Um, and also, related to that, is when we cut down trees and then plow up the fields and then plant um, soy or corn or palm oil, that has greenhouse gas emissions associated with it because of that, because of those changes. Um, basically, there's carbon dioxide locked up without getting into the science of it. There's carbon dioxide locked up in the soils and as we change the land, that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases gets released. Now, besides greenhouse gas emissions, we also lose biodiversity, and we lose biodiverse areas. If you've traveled through, again, southern Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, there are whole primary natural areas, um, primary forests, I should say, that have been leveled and simply we've planted palm oil in their place. And um, monocultures don't support many, many organisms. 
right? You don't see a lot of organisms in a cornfield. You see some pests and maybe some rats, and that's about it. So um, cutting down these <clears throat> these natural areas for to produce food has has major effects on on biodiversity, and then as well, we're cutting down forests um, to package our food. Um, there's uh, a link there that. Uh, to, K to a report that KFC and Mattel um, have been responsible for deforestation in Indonesia to create paper to package their food and Barbie dolls and such. So food production has a huge impact on, on, um, on deforestation. Um, Not to mention that, as most of you probably know, as our food intake changes, our food consumption changes, um, we emit more greenhouse gases. Uh, you can see there that um, heavy meat eaters um, produce almost twice as much carbon dioxide equivalent per day pounds carbon dioxide equivalent per day as vegetarians. Okay, and I don't want to get into too much of a debate over, you know, eating meat or not eating meat quite yet, um, but we can talk about that in the discussion. So we know that meat production, meat consumption results in a greater carbon footprint, a greater in greater greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and as countries and citizens in those countries become more wealthy, um, the trend is that meat consumption increases. Um, and it's not like the Asia Pacific where meat is usually um, part of the sauce or part of the dish that goes on top of the carbohydrate. And in a lot of the um, developed places, remember that Meat is is the the main part of many dishes. So as we get richer, we tend to eat more meat. And then again, not to mention getting that meat from the farm to the abattoir to the packaging plant to the market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of that has um, has greenhouse gas emissions related to it. And then on top of that, um, if you live in the Asia Pacific as I do, you know that things are wrapped and double wrapped and on a plastic tray as well. So besides the fact that we're producing food that harms the environment, we're also um, we're also wrapping it and packaging it in ways that harm the environment. Um, Food production also, I think, can be used to illustrate, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Illustrate the, um, the, the lack of distribution um, or um, unsustainable practices with regards to society. Um, you can see there um, a map of the world, and I just found this chart spin. If you ever are interested in any chart, they, they likely have it. You can see the amount of macronutrients, so um, carbohydrates, proteins, um, fats, etc., consumed by country. And you can see, see in, um, in Europe and North America, um, there's the dark green, which means that we consume about 3,500 calories per person per day. Now compare that to places in um, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, in Central America, in South Asia. There's places that are getting less than half of that, um, all because of, well, I think it's a long story why, why it happens, but um, subsidies and, and growing um, growing practices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the way we're producing food and the way we're distributing food isn't really fair right now. Um, 
I found a stat that said 842 million people are undernourished right now, and a further 2 billion suffer micronutrient deficiencies due to a lack of access to food. Um, and people aren't getting enough food, so they're not healthy. They're having to visit the healthcare professionals more often or the clinics. Um, as students, if you're not getting the right food, um, you're not able to learn um, as well as others. Um, you're not, not able to do as much work. And, uh, and yeah, there's a whole bunch of evils associated with our, how we're distributing our poorly grown food. And then uh, there's all sorts of other issues. Um, conflict is a major one. Uh, so there's, um, in South America again, um, there's been a number of documented conflicts between soy ranchers and, uh, or soy farmers I should say, and ranchers um, going in and cutting down indigenous people's rainforest and there being armed conflicts between the ranchers and the indigenous people and there being deaths associated with this. Um, we, I think we all know as well that um, our production is, is basically putting us in conflict with nature as well. We are, you know, to grow palm oil we're destroying orangutan habitat and orangutans. Um, we, uh, what else? Um, I can't think of another example right now, but um, we are in conflict with nature. How we're growing our food um, is is most of the time unethical. Um, there's if you look at PETA's website, uh, basically our, all the chicken we eat right now are grown in in um, in chicken farms where they the chickens don't have access to the outside. Um, they don't ever see the outside because they're sterile environments. They're grown in cages uh, hardly bigger than their body. Um, and it's just not very nice to the, to the chickens. Same thing with cattle. Um, we grow cattle in feedlots, um, a thousand head to basically a cement, uh, cement platform. Um, they stand around don't exercise, they, they stand in their, in their waste products, um, and then as soon as they're big enough, we slaughter them, which isn't really a very humane way to treat the things that are the products that are keeping us healthy. And then lastly, um, our current agricultural practices are affecting our health. They're affect, affecting society's health. There's um, numerous instances of sewage from those feedlots um, getting into water supplies and causing um, diarrhea and giardia and all sorts of other um, waterborne um, illnesses. There's chemicals that we use in those feedlots um, like antibiotics and um, pesticides that get in to our food supply as well and are making us sick. So I think I could go on with, with how it affects the economy and, and society and the environment negatively, but I think we get the idea that, that basically how we're growing our food has a number of impacts and has definitely affects our, our or increases our human-induced climate change. So, with that in mind, I wanted to look at Hong Kong as a case study, and, and this could probably, um, I've lived in, like uh, Robin said, I've lived in Thailand, I've lived in Cambodia, I've lived here, I've traveled throughout the region, and there is a, uh, Hong Kong is not far off from what happens in, in, the, in the entire region. So in Hong Kong, Food waste has become a really big issue. Um, uh, 
I'll explain why in a minute. But basically, there's a tendency to overpackage everything, uh, and this has to do, I think, in my mind, with convenience versus necessity. It's easier to, well, it's more convenient for the consumer to pick up something that's nicely prepackaged. It's more convenient as well for the retailer, like the oranges there, um, to sell something that doesn't, uh, that's not going to get bruised and they're not going to be able to sell um, uh, versus necessity. We don't need to package our oranges like that. Um, we don't need to double wrap and triple wrap and put things on a plastic tray. But in Hong Kong with you know, uh, with people who living busy lifestyles and uh, very few people having kitchens that they can cook in, convenience is king. Um, it's difficult to recycle in Hong Kong, and I've done um, in classes and and uh, just on my own done some research. Um, apparently, you know, as with most places. Back in the 1950s, everything was recycled um, because everything had value. Every little piece of string, every little piece of metal, every piece of glass or glass bottle got recycled. Um, but I think, again, because of that convenience factor, um, we moved away from that and we moved to products that can't be recycled. And so recycling isn't... Uh, what's the word? It's not, not that it's not widely accepted. People know about it, but people won't go out of their way to recycle. So a lot of that packaging, like on the oranges that you see right there, goes right to the landfill. Um, and lastly, I think because uh, convenience is king, because the pace of life, because, um, because people want things now rather than having to wait for them. Often cost comes over quality. So if you can get uh, a cheap meal for say 27 or th let's say 30 Hong Kong dollars which is about um, five-ish, you no know, about less, about four-ish US dollars, um, the meat probably comes from a feedlot the rice is who knows where it comes from, the cheapest source. Um, and so people tend to prefer cost over the quality of food. Um, there we go. Whoops, skipped over one too many. Okay. So the reason that food waste has become a really big issue in Hong Kong is because all of our waste goes to one of three landfills right now. And you can see this is called, this is the uh, landfill there is called Scent, the southeast, um, southeast New Territories Landfill. That's what it stands for. So you can see the landfill, well, in the center of the picture, all around it uh, were basically forests. They were secondary forests because most of Hong Kong was logged, but they were still forests and supported, you know, quite a lot of um, local wildlife. Um, all of that in the, f in the background kind of of the picture was all reclaimed. So that's Hong Kong Harbor, and basically they dumped piles and piles of sand and rocks and reclaim that land. So obviously that had further effects on natural habitats. Um, this the statistic that uh, Feeding Hong Kong uses is that Hong Kongers throw away 3,200, 3,200 tons of food waste every day. But uh, food waste is massive. A, a lot that goes to these landfills is also construction waste. Um, and the issue, quite frankly, is that our, the landfills are going to be filled, um, some estimates say, within the next five years. By 2018, I think, the landfills are s supposed to be filled. And so that means that either they reclaim more land to make more landfills, or they cut farther into the forest, 
which remember is going to release more CO2. Um, and uh, or we there's another you have to find another solution. The issues the other issues with landfills is that they produce methane as a byproduct of decomposition. And methane, as most of you probably know, is another of the greenhouse gases. So because they don't have access to oxygen, they don't produce carbon dioxide, they produce methane instead, which reminds me of another point. Um, if you are able to get packaging, um, such as paper, often I'll hear people say, oh, it's paper, it'll, bi it'll biodegrade. If it goes to a landfill, it's going to get covered up by more trash and compacted down and not going to have access to oxygen. And so it's going to biodegrade very, very, very slowly. And as it does, it's going to produce lots of methane. So the idea that something biodegrades, if it goes to a landfill, really it doesn't biodegrade that quickly at all. So the issue is our landfills are filling up. We're creating all sorts of food waste. Our landfills are filling up. The current favored proposal to deal with our waste once the landfills are full is to make an incinerator. Uh, an incinerator is basically a huge furnace that burns the garbage. Now, this is a, a, an artist representation of the incinerator. That incinerator uh, and the associated instructors uh, or s associated structures don't exist yet. It's currently uh, well. It will have to be reclaimed as well, um, and that is um, some of the last remaining pink dolphin um, territory in the world, um, which obviously has huge environmental um, um, issues related to it. Uh, the incinerator itself is going to produce more greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it's going to affect the air pollution more negatively. Um, incinerators have been proven to produce dioxins and particulate matter um, and all sorts of other chemicals in a place where the air quality is, quite frankly, very poor most of the time. And then it's on an island, so we have to transport all of the garbage to the island with ships that use very dirty fuel, which is going to have further greenhouse gas emissions. So huge issues related to Hong Kong's garbage. And hopefully you're getting the idea that, OK, we're producing this food poorly. It has all sorts of consequences. We're wasting the food. And how we deal with the waste has all sorts of consequences. And this is happening not just in Hong Kong, but all over the world. So enough doom and gloom. What can we do to curb human-induced climate change and move towards sustainable energy? So the last few slides I've devoted to just that, to, to creative, sustainable solutions for dealing with our waste. The first one is to move back to less packaging and move back to shopping in wet markets. If you live in the Asia Pacific, I'm sure you are close to what we call a wet market in, in Hong Kong, um, where the fruits and vegetables and meat and whatever else is often not packaged. I know in, in Cambodia near my house, um, you could get your rice. You could bring a container and get rice. You could get soap. You could get um, you know, beans. You could get all sorts, and none of it was packaged. Um, the picture in the top right corner there is a, uh, a concept grocery store called Unverpacked, um, which apparently is being developed in Berlin where nothing is packaged. You bring your own containers, um, you fill it up, you take it to the cashier and she weighs it and tells you how much it's going to cost. So I think the first few solutions is to cut the waste 
and cut the consumption off at the source. Um, if we can be smarter about how we package stuff, and how we shop for stuff, then we can we can get rid of the waste. Um, well, period, we can get rid of the waste. Um, I won't, I'm conscious of the time, I won't play this right now, I might share it on the Facebook page. Another way is to change our eating habits. And in this clip, um, Graham Hill, who started a website called Tree Hugger, uh, I, you might have seen it, he talks about being, uh, a, he calls it weekday veg, and what some other organizations call it, um, um, call, um, my brain's just, called flexitarianism. So you can eat meat, just eat less of it. Um, so I'll, I won't play it right now. I'll, I'll share it with you guys on the Facebook page and, and you can watch it at your leisure. But it is a good one and it does raise some good points. Uh, another way is let's get creative with our packaging so they do indeed biodegrade. Um, on the right, the package with the shoes in them is made out of cellulose. Cellulose, for you biologists, um, you know that cellulose is simply glucose molecules linked together, like plants do to make starch. So this completely, bi uh, completely decomposes. You can decompose it in your own composter at home. Um, it takes very little time because it's plant-based, uh, and it turns back into nutrients. Um, the picture below, uh, there's a restaurant here in Hong Kong that all of their packaging is either bioplastic or cellulose. And you can see there they're called um, vegware, and they're made out of bioplastic straws that are um, have a lower, uh, what's it say, lower carbon footprint. Um, it's made out of vegetable-based plastic, um, and they biodegrade. You can see there, keep cool and out of sunlight. If they get hit by sun, then they biodegrade. So let's be more creative in how we package things. Let's get rid of packaging. Let's eat less stuff that needs packaging, and let's get more creative in how we package things. So the next option is if you cut you cut things off at the source, the second one, it, the, the, the waste is already made. What do we do then? Um, and the, the favored scheme here is what they call a waste charging scheme. So um, basically, you have to pay to dispose of your garbage. And in different places, they've done it by mass or by volume. So you buy a bag for one US dollar or whatever, and that you fill that bag as much as possible. Um, but basically, that bag comes at a premium, because the more bags you use, the more expensive it is to, to get rid of your waste. Or you can do that by weight. Um, you know, Every household has an allotment of, say, one, one kilogram per day. So that's going to encourage people to decrease their waste um, because they're going to have to pay to get rid of it. Um, and the last one, it's made. The, the waste is, is already, or the food is already produced. The waste is already produced. What do we do with it? Um, what do we do with it now? And uh, someone told me about a... Um, I think it was um, Hania in, in the first one of the first lectures. She was talking about one of her favorite organizations, and one of them I think was similar to Daily Table. And basically, they buy um, blemished food from again the producers or the retailers, and they sell it or give it away at highly discounted prices. Um, Food Link. Um, will go and collect cooked food and distribute it to homeless shelters and, and people that need it. Um, Feeding Hong Kong does the same thing. So the waste is made, let's figure out how to how to distribute it better. Okay, And then the last one 
the last possible solution is what they call plasma gasification. And this, we can't do anything with the packaging. Um, we've, we've distributed the food as best as we can, and there's still a little bit of waste left over. Now, plasma gasification is basically a really high-tech furnace. And you put the food in at the top. That's what that little kind of upside-down shower thingy is. And it gets heated up really, really high, about 1,500 degrees Celsius, and turned into a gas. And then that gas is exposed to plasma at another really, really high temperature. And it basically shreds the molecules of waste. It gets more energy out than it puts out waste and toxic materials. The downfall is that it's quite expensive. Um, I can't remember the, the cost of, of, a, of a plant, but it is quite expensive, and in a lot of places it's probably prohibitively expensive. However, it is used in places around the world. The U.S. Navy uses them on some of their, their, uh, their ships. Um, it's used in Ottawa, Canada. It's used in England. It's used in um, Sweden, um, Japan. And basically they need to import garbage now because they use it to make energy. So, um, <clears throat> so there are solutions, excuse me, to deal with, deal with food production and food waste that I think are probably kind of on the fringe right now that, that we need to adopt more so if, if we want to achieve that goal eight. <clears throat> so that's that's about it for me. I'm conscious of the time. I've droned on for about 40 minutes. I'm going to leave the discussion questions there, and perhaps after you submit your um, your homework from last week, um, we can spend some time tomorrow uh, on these discussion questions. I was hoping to get to how is food waste dealt with near you, and if there are some interesting um, NGOs or strategies that you know of, perhaps you could share those with the group. Um, are there food waste or waste issues in general in your local area? Um, like I said, it's a big issue here, um, um, but you've probably seen it uh, around the web. Uh, Sweden has to import garbage because of their plasma gasification uh, incinerators. Uh, what are some solutions to food waste that you know about? What about solutions that might not even exist? Um, a f I was talking to a friend and he mentioned that what if you could eat the packaging that foods came packaged in? Like if you had some sort of cellulose container that contained rice and you could eat the container that the rice contained in. Um, and then what are some steps that you take in your daily life to decrease your contribution to climate change or food waste as we might, as we're talking about today. So I'll, I'll post those as well to the Facebook page um, and perhaps we can talk about those um, tomorrow. So without further ado, um, I'm just going to see if anyone has any questions um, that perhaps I can answer. Yeah, we have a couple. Shall I? I can read it out if you want. Sure. Uh, yeah, so, well, anyway, first, thanks very much, Chris. That was really interesting, and I have a number of things which I have written down because I, 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 I didn't know um, uh, at all. So... Anyway, well, let's just go straight into the questions. And Noelia has asked uh, about what, yeah, what will happen when there is no landfill. Oh, that there's not enough landfill to contain all the waste. Uh, like, wh where would we dump our waste? And I, I think she she's also looking at um, in developed countries. We're basically sending our waste to developing countries. Um, yeah. So I, I guess you kind of like you touched on some of those issues, like with the incinerator or. Um, 
yeah, but but what? Yeah, what what will happen when when place well, when 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 all the landfills are full up? What what happens? I mean. Yeah, I think that's probably going to be um, that's probably going to be a problem that we face certainly and have been facing in developed countries um, for the last little while and will be facing certainly in the near future. Um, like I said in Hong Kong, the options are slim. The options are either build bigger landfills or put it in the ocean, which we've done in throughout history to, you know, to negative effect, or burn it. Uh, and I think, you know, if we're talking about kind of daily waste, unfortunately, those right now are the uh, the most viable options. They're not the best options, but yeah. they're what most most um, most countries choose to do. And Noelia touched on you know a very uh, another interesting topic related to climate change and sustainable energy and and waste, um, and that's exporting our waste. There's um, there's places like Accra, Ghana, which has the most polluted land on the planet because we in North America have exported our e-waste to Accra for the last 20 years and now it's decomposing and leaching heavy metals into the soil the same there's a um, you can find a uh, like a 60 minutes um, thing on China and e-waste going to China and it's that's becoming a huge issue where we're exporting our waste, we're getting rid of our waste, it's not our problem anymore, to places that are either um, poor and disadvantaged and will take it at their, usually at their cost. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. I think it brings up a lot of, a lot of equality issues and, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think what was also interesting was when you mentioned about how Sweden has to import uh, import what, like rubbish or refuse from abroad or, or wherever. And uh, it was also when I I studied at uh, UWC Adriatic in Italy, and um, I remember learning that the the incinerators there they actually they they'll take recycling from uh for, like it and it's not just in the region where I was and actually, actually my German friend told me it happens in in, in Germany as well. That they, they they if if they don't have enough uh, like normal refuse to, to keep their incinerators going, they'll actually uh, top it up with recycling um, because they depend on the energy from it. But it's just like it it, it seems bizarre. I, I mean, very bizarre, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, let's go to and then it is Mears Mears uh, said. That she agrees that it's it's good to cut food waste at the source and have a waste charging scheme, uh, but isn't there a danger that people will increase littering in nature if they have to pay to dispose of their garbage? Um, that that is exactly the um, the rebuttal that um, that a lot of people have for that waste charging scheme. In uh, you know Hong Kong's got this reputation of being the financial capital of Asia. Um, and there are a lot of incredibly wealthy people, but there are a lot of people on minimum wage. And minimum wage here is 30 Hong Kong dollars an hour. That's, um, well, that's less than, what is it? It's about $4 an hour. Um, it's about 8 US dollars to, um, sorry, 8 Hong Kong dollars to 1 US dollar. So that, that is the, the big concern that people will start dumping it wherever they can. I just read an article um, in the Globe and Mail, which is Canada's national newspaper, on people doing that in Canada, which is a pretty rich, well-off country that has the resources to deal with, with their garbage. But people are still dumping, you know, their old couches and washing machines and all sorts of stuff just at the side of the road because we charge them to get rid of it. If you take it to a refuse transfer station or a tip, you'll get charged hundreds of dollars to get rid of it. So that is that is the problem, or that is the issue that comes up. I suppose the only 
solution to it is that you you either started at something that's so incredibly cheap that everyone can afford it and kind of increase it or yeah maybe you know there's some sort of subsidized program but it's it's a hopefully sustainable city planners take that into account when they when they put that if they decide to go with that scheme yeah it's yeah good question and also, what they I think they've tried in some places in the UK is that they've tried to pay people like to reward them for their recycling almost by giving them uh, vouchers to spend in the supermarket. But then you have the, the the situation where people are actually being paid for producing waste in a sort of bizarre <laughs> another sort of yeah. bizarre. Situation. Yeah, actually, totally. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's another interesting one. But I mean, there's. I think it it goes to highlight though that there are, there are solutions, and you know, there's a range of issues with the solutions. As with everything, nothing's nothing's black or white. But yeah, I think that's where us, you know, sustainable, hopefully sustainable development experts come in and and kind of try and weigh it all up and say, okay, this is the best the best option. That's all we can do. I think. Yeah, sure. No, I, I think that's very true. Um, I, I, if you don't mind, could I ask a couple of questions I, I wrote down as we were, uh, as as you were speaking? Absolutely, I'll try and answer them. Great. Oh, it's also linking because I'm I'm thinking about the students in my in the EMEA uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa region. They they they've been really interested in um, a genetically modified food, um, which you I don't think you really you, you didn't really oh you didn't mention, but. I, I was just interested in, so theoretically, if, if I, I'm sort of playing devil's advocate here, but if, if, if you could genetically modify crops to give a higher yield and higher quality food so that, it, say, for beauty standards, it wasn't thrown away before it got to the supermarket and it lasted longer, all that, like, and would that, could that theoretically be a solution to the, um, or, some of this cost, the environmental cost of uh, food production? I think it definitely could if you used it right. Um, I'll put it out there, I'm, I'm a, um, a full supporter of genetically, of genetic modification. When it, when it comes to wasting less or feeding more or um, getting more nutrients from it, there's, in, in, the Americas and in Europe, um, our soils are becoming so depleted because we're, we've been growing on them for so long that the foods no longer have the nutrients that they did 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. So if you can genetically modify something so it's more beautiful, it stays right, stays you know perfect, perfectly right for longer, and you're getting more nutrients out of it, and so you're wasting less, I think that, in my mind, it only seems it, it only seems like the right thing to do. It almost and seems too good to be true. Almost seems too good to be true. Um, some of you might have heard of um, of David Suzuki, who is uh, a famous Canadian biologist, and he was back in like the '60s and '70s. He was doing genetic modification, and he kind of came, uh, he says he came to, and, and he's a huge opponent of genetic modification now, but their claim, well, most, most of the claims are, you know, well, what is it going to do to your body? Well, it might shave a year or two off our, our lifespan, but what's it going to do to the earth, and what's it going to do to future generations? So, personally, I'm willing to I'm willing to take the chance that genetically modified foods um, aren't gonna aren't gonna be as healthy for me, although I'm pretty confident they are, um, for the fact that they might have uh, better uh, better prospects for a whole bunch of those malnourished people or whatever. Um, yeah. Very interesting. Uh, on a similar vein, uh, well, I, I can't remember where I read it, but I remember reading that 
in the UK where we have very limited, especially in England where it's so relatively densely populated, there's very little agricultural land um, that's particularly fertile, uh, that actually to support our demand for, say, I don't, I don't know, meat or chicken, we're going to have to, act like, like actually battery farms are the best way to, to in terms of not, not using l land that could be used for other things, say for forests or, 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 or growing other crops or, or whatever, that actually say, battery farming is, is one of them, environmentally in terms of its, like it, it's less ethical, but it's, it, reduces, it reduces the impact on uh, greenhouse gases. Well, yeah, that's, there you touched on a, on a bunch there. Um, my, my response would be that, yes, battery farms um, and feedlots can allow you to grow more in a smaller area. That's what they're designed to do, and that's what they do best. Um, but in terms of the quality of the food coming out, the produce coming out of those feedlots and battery farms, um, I don't know that it's necessarily as good. Um, certainly if you look at the chemicals and the, you know, the quote-unquote pollution associated with it, the sewage and the, and the um, greenhouse gas emissions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, I think rather than say, okay, we need to do factory farming to feed our obsession with, you know, for beef, we, we need to really change our outlook on how much beef we eat. Um, and it's hard. It's um, running the sustainability group, we call them the campus ecologists at school. Um, we started Meatless Mondays uh, three years ago now, and that was an uphill battle to try and get the idea that you don't need meat for every meal. We do it for all three meals on, on Monday, which most places, I think, just do it for lunch. So you're talking three out of 21 meals rather than one out of 21. But you don't need meat for every meal. And I come from a family that's owned a butcher shop since the 1930s, so that for for me was an uphill an uphill battle as well. But I think you know to to say that we need to have feedlots to supply it. I think that kind of highlights an issue altogether right there. That we need to we need to look at how we eat and what we eat and what it's costing everything, what it's costing the earth, what it's costing us, and I think we need to reflect on that. So, you know, who knows? Maybe there's maybe there's other ways. Um, the UN produced a report recently that said um, insects are the solution to for the world's protein problems. Um, there's labs that are growing meat now you know, with perfect amounts of nutrients and protein, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So maybe the solution is something else. Maybe it's not feedlots and just saying, okay, well, we need our meat, so we're going to have to grow this this much. I mean, everyone at school on Meatless Mondays, you know, they'll have meatless meatless meat alternatives. So they'll have like meatless sausages and stuff like that, and everyone kind of makes fun of them. But people, vegetarians, vegans have been eating these soy products for years, and there's soy sausages and soy chicken wings and soy cheese and you name it. So there's the there's alternatives out there. I reckon. That my opinion anyway doesn't mean I, it's the right. No, I, I agree. I'm I'm vegetarian as well. But I just <laughs> wanted to put it out there. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we're at the end of the hour. I do have a few more questions, but I, I think the conversation could go on forever. So, um, and I know it's late there, so I, I think I'll I'll let you go. 
Uh, but I, I just wanted to thank you very much for, for taking the time to be here, and it was fascinating. And um, yeah, well, uh, you have your Facebook group, and uh, yeah. the conversation can t continue there. So um, yeah, yeah uh, so yeah, th thanks again. and um, Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. And everyone else, see ya. Bye. Thanks for watching.